This video is brought to you by NordVPN, who's giving my audience an enormous discount on a two-year plan plus one month for free by going to nordvpn.com slash jaysreviews or by using the promo code jaysreviews as seen on screen. In case you're unfamiliar with it, NordVPN is a virtual private network that encrypts your data, like your IP address or internet history, giving you more privacy and security when using the internet. NordVPN allows users to connect to thousands of different servers in 60 countries, and what's great about this is that it allows you to access content that's region locked on streaming services like Netflix. In the case of video games, NordVPN allowed me, while using the Android emulator, Bluestacks, to easily connect to the Taiwanese Google Play Store and download Rockman X Dive the mobile Mega Man X game that was not released in the West. Maybe someday I'll play enough of it to review it and finally complete the all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective I started way back in 2016. Like I said, I achieved this effortlessly using NordVPN, and you guys can get a massive discount on a two-year plan by using the first link in the description or the promo code JaysReviews. That's one word, all lowercase letters. Like I said, the first link in the description and the pinned comment. Having said that, let's get on with the show. Depending on your point of view, the last main series Sonic game I reviewed was either Sonic 06 or Sonic and the Secret Rings. Either way, not gonna do a full recap at this point as you can go watch those two videos to get caught up. I will say this though, by this point the series was facing the unique challenge brought upon itself by Sonic 06 and Shadow the Hedgehog before it. It's now a joke. But here's the paradox. In the late 2000s, you could say whatever you wanted about Sonic games, but that did not stop Sonic the Hedgehog from still being a massive brand. On Xbox 360, Sonic 06 sold over a million copies, and Secret Rings was even more successful on the Wii. I can talk more about the success of that game in another video. Sonic is just a big name when buying games for kids. It doesn't really matter what anyone says about the games on the internet. So it's pretty easy to see why these games came out in the numbers they did. It sold units, and that's what makes the world go around, after all. But bad press is certainly not a good thing, so what do you do about that? Well, you've got to stress quality control above all else. You can't just release another Sonic 06. I talked about this in the Secret Rings video. 06 could have killed Sonic, and maybe it would have had it coming, but it didn't. This opportunity does not come around often when discussing making games after a big disaster. But thanks to the sales, Sonic had the chance to bounce back. Two years after Sonic 06 came out, we got Sonic's next adventure on the Xbox 360, 2008's Sonic Unleashed. I remember the pre-release of Sonic Unleashed like it was yesterday. I said in the previous video that the first time I had ever really gotten excited for a video game before I ever came out was Secret Rings, but Unleashed was like that times 10. I mean, every trailer for Sonic Unleashed just looked fucking incredible. I would drop everything to watch the new trailers as they came out, and it showed off a lot too. More speed than you've ever seen in a Sonic game, better graphics than ever before. The game is going to take you all over the world to a bunch of different settings. Everyone loves a grand adventure, and this looked like it was going to deliver. November could not come soon enough. Like, dare I say, this game almost looked better than Sonic the Hedgehog. And that's my favorite game of all time. This is 2008 logic I'm reciting, don't get mad. But of course, there was one elephant in the room. Yeah, they had a specific gimmick in mind with this one. Sonic was going to be his normal self during the day, but at night he'd transform into Sonic the Werehog. Nice. Luckily nobody has to say that line in the actual game. I was afraid of this segment getting in the way of the fun. In fact, when I first got Unleashed, I just started a new save file like three times to keep replaying Windmill Isle Day and to avoid the night stage that followed it. But back to the pre-release, the Werehog didn't deter me from being hyped for this game because Sonic games have had other playstyles before. Although, come to think of it, I had played through five of the six SADX campaigns around Unleashed's release, but I had just never finished it because I couldn't get past the first big stage. So it can't be worse than that, right? And Jack transforms into Dark Jack in Jack 2, and that was fun, right? Point is, the night concept was something to be skeptical about, but not fully afraid of. The Werehog's existence also caused this trailer to be made, where it's supposed to be like a documentary Bigfoot kind of thing. It was really memorable. Never forgot it, even now, 13 years later. Over the last six months, a nighttime phenomenon has been witnessed across many cities around the world. On Thursday, March 13th, at 3.14 a.m., loud animal noises and crashing sounds awoke many sleeping citizens. Investigators discovered traces of blue hair at these locations. 
Seriously, that's a great trailer. In addition to the ones we already had for the gameplay, it kind of sounds like Brainiac from the DCAU voicing it. Can't be sure it's him. Corey Burton, that is, but it sounded like him. This development was highly improbable. I first got Sonic 06 back in 2007, and it took me till fall of 2008 to beat it. And that's also something I'll never forget. I never had guides as a kid, so I just had to figure it out. My point being that I had played the shit out of Sonic 06 by this point, and I was ready for the next game, which finally came out on November 14th of 2008. I think most are in agreement that this right here, the opening cutscene of Sonic Unleashed, is one of, if not the greatest Sonic cutscene of all time. Shadow the Hedgehog had made massive strides in the CG department, and then Sonic 06 had some hit or miss CG cutscenes, but for 2008 standards, this feels like actual movies. The lighting, the detail, it's perfect. Sonic tears through enemies with personality and the usage of slow motion, it just looks absolutely fantastic. Like I said, they put in a crap ton of detail here, like Eggman's mech dropping shells to the ground after the bullets were fired, or the animation stretching Sonic's limbs to exaggerate motion like never before. The first half of this cutscene tells a story almost completely without words, and for many, that's what makes it so great. For me, I love this fast-paced, action-packed Sonic, and I just think it's impressive they could convey so much without dialogue. Eggman's trying to conquer the world because he has a space armada over the planet. Sonic is cool as hell for busting in with fire behind him. He's cocky, he's powerful, he's fast. It's like, describe the dynamic of Sonic and Robotnik in one scene, and it's this one. As for the plot itself, we obviously begin a Medeus Rest with another Sonic and Eggman encounter. This time, Sonic already has the seven Chaos Emeralds and transforms into Super Sonic to wreck Eggman's entire station yet again. Only this time, it was a trap, and Eggman steals the Chaos Emeralds from Sonic and uses their power to generate his machine, a giant laser that blasts into the heart of the planet, shattering the world into seven different continents. Think Advance 3, but like, way more intense. Eggman did this because he read in a thing called the Gaia Manuscripts that deep inside the planet resides a power called Dark Gaia, but to awaken it early, he had to break open the planet for Dark Gaia to escape. This act completely drained all the life from the Chaos Emeralds, and the evil energy of Dark Gaia has also transformed Sonic himself into this werehog form. With all that said and done, Eggman launches Sonic out of the station and he crashes towards the planet. Sonic Unleashed. We then get an in-engine cutscene with Sonic crash landing on Earth because, you know, Sonic characters can breathe in space and survive falls of infinite height. When landing, Sonic realizes he's crash landed on this tiny creature that has no memory, but before we can worry about that, the sun rises, turning Sonic back into his normal form. After awakening, Dark Gaia couldn't maintain its form, so its essence spread across the world, but only comes about during the night. So during the day, everything, including Sonic, is back to normal. Sonic decides to help the little guy find his memory out of guilt for landing on him, giving the name Chip, as the two run into Tails, who helps them travel from continent to continent on board the Tornado 3. The guys find Professor Pickle, who's an expert on Dark Gaia, informing the group that by traveling to each continent's Gaia temple, you can restore the power to the Chaos Emeralds and put the planet back together. Sonic Unleashed is a globe-trotting adventure, however, the opening act is a bit more linear. When the first cutscenes are done, you play a level as Sonic, go to the town, then another level as Sonic, night hits, you get the first Werehog stage, fly to Spagonia, travel to Missouri to save Professor Pickle, and then activate the first Gaia Temple. It's at that point when the first act of the game is over, and the structure opens up a bit more, as multiple areas will be available at once, and you can just choose which one you want to play. The world map is really well handled. Each country has its list of levels for you to select, and depending on if you want to play a day stage or a night stage, you can press a button to turn the sun faster as to change the time of day. The world map also shows how close you are to completion as it will show the planet coming back together as you get further and further into the game. When discussing how the gameplay actually works, we have two styles this time around, Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Werehog. When starting with the day stages, you might be thinking you already know what to expect. But this is a world after Sonic 06, and the adventure formula is going to be left behind alongside it. So with this game, they wanted to try something much different. Sonic Rush in 2005 made strides to innovate the 2D formula by giving Sonic the boost ability. With the press of a button, Sonic could launch himself forward at high speeds, and his ability to do that was tied to a gauge at the side of the screen. So they brought the boost mechanic into the 3D series, starting with Sonic Unleashed. On its face, having a mechanic called the boost kind of reinforces the idea that many have surrounding 3D Sonic, where the gameplay from the Genesis games, speed being a reward for understanding the physics and route memorization, was lost. After all, 3D Sonic needs to make loops and other Sonic staples something the player watches rather than plays themselves. Now having a button that makes Sonic go fast only makes that look worse. I get that, but Sonic Unleashed is far from the kind of game that you press one button to win throughout. Before getting into the subject of how the mechanics are applied, we best cover the basics of how it plays. In the Secret Rings video, I mentioned that Sonic has started to control more like a car. He even came with a brake button. In Sonic Unleashed, I'd actually say that's the goal. The objective of every stage is still to get from one side of the stage to the other by dodging obstacles and blasting through enemies and whatever set pieces each stage has, 
but now you need to boost through enemies, and to maintain your boost gauge you need to collect rings which will keep the gauge maxed as you plow through at warp speed. Since the objective is to go as fast as possible, the designers have made boosting where Sonic controls the smoothest, but on the flip side, they have neglected the ground control. We've seen this transformation take place over the last several games. After the adventure installments, each new game has found a new way to fail at replicating the controls from SA1 and 2. In Unleashed, this isn't as big of a problem because like I said, the boosting forward mechanic works really well. It's just worth noting that Sonic's ground control when not boosting is really clunky and awkward as you take off really quickly but can barely turn around. Simply put, Sonic just doesn't handle that well when not boosting, but that rarely ever is a thing in this game, so I'll stop hammering on it. The parts where the controls in Unleashed lack in more major areas is how the new moves are integrated. To manage Sonic traveling at such a high speed, by pressing the L1 or R1 buttons, Sonic will do the quick step where he shifts lanes. Many times in these stages, Sonic will be on a pathway with a couple of lanes on it, and you'll need to press the L1 button to shift left and the R1 button to shift right to dodge obstacles like the barrels and rooftop run or the laser fire and dragon road. Most of the time this works really well and is pretty intuitive, especially on grind rails. Shadow the Hedgehog kind of implemented something like this, but Unleashed has fully realized it. When on grind rails, obstacles like lasers or spikes will be in the way, and you'll need to jump to the rails next to it with the L1 button or the R1 button. I get it, the grinding gameplay of SA2 is completely dead and buried with mechanics as automated as this, but I prefer something simpler and more functional than having something with less reliability. Grinding still is about avoiding obstacles, so it's still gameplay, unlike the segments of nothing we saw in 06 for example. The only issue I have with the quick step mechanics would be the parts where it doesn't send you far enough, like this part of Skyscraper Scamper where the lanes are huge so you don't dodge far enough for the bombs. It's weird, but far less reliable than the quick step would be the other speed control method, the drift. By holding down the L2 or R2 buttons at high speed, Sonic will drift alongside the edge of a tight corner and keep his speed. But I think this mechanic was just not fine-tuned enough to work. The problem with the drift is that at high speeds, it's very likely that the wide arc of the move will just send you flying into the pit you were trying to avoid, and at low speeds, it still kind of happens pretty regularly. Performing well on this extra stage of Savannah Citadel is pretty nightmarish because of it. Since I don't think the drift works that well, I just stop my forward momentum altogether and just run through these parts without boosting, which doesn't control well like I said. These three negatives I have with how Boost Sonic handles is entirely understandable though. This was the first time the developers tackled something like this, and there were some issues that needed to be worked out. I'm sure that when developing the drift, for example, they imagine an experience where Sonic's speed never lets up as the player makes turns at high speeds would be really exhilarating, but the execution of that in Sonic Unleashed warrants more fine-tuning. But the foundation is there for really great gameplay. Unleashed has several stages set in its many countries. Windmill Isle, Savannah Citadel, Cool Edge, Rooftop Run, Dragon Road, Arid Sands, Skyscraper Scamper, and Jungle Joyride. I think every Sonic stage in this game is a blast to play. There are areas of the controls that need to be improved, where the levels themselves are fantastic. We can certainly dive deeper into this when talking about the ranking system of Sonic Unleashed, but as of now, I can say this has got to be some of the most arcade-like Sonic level design I've ever played. Being good at Sonic Unleashed does require a lot of trial and error, because let me tell you, these stages are actually pretty difficult. Do or die decision making, like a light dash trail or avoiding a crumbling platform at this really high speed. This sounds like the ground for me to get really pissed off, but I think mastering the stages of Unleashed is satisfying, because while there are moments where you just have to know what to do to get a better route, the game provides context clues sometimes, like ring trails showing you the best angles to jump at, or just having an alternative but less fast route to explore if you miss your chance for the fast route. In that sense, it's similar to the Genesis games, because knowing that this side path of Jungle Joyride exists takes much less time than the alternative. Going at such a fast pace means a lot of players will just miss the alternate routes in Sonic Unleashed, but they definitely are there in abundance. As simple as this is, I can't not enjoy replaying stages of Unleashed because outmaneuvering falling pillars in arid sands before they even had the chance to kill you or making the right turns while running on the water in Jungle Joyride is a thrill, and that's what the developers were going for making the game. These levels are a lot of fun. It's built on a good foundation, the challenge is high but satisfying to overcome, the level design provides a lot to replay and look forward to, it's just a great set of stages. And it's really impressive how much there is to them. You can't plop Boost Sonic in a stage like Emerald Coast from Sonic Adventure because the stage would be over before it really got going. To design a stage around the boost mechanics requires the devs to create a long stage in terms of sheer ground, but the character is going along it at a speed this high. So yeah, bring on the 5 or 6 minute stages, I've no objection to that. 
I'm just saying, I'm really impressed because that's a lot of stage to construct when the player won't really be able to stop and sniff the roses. Rooftop Run is the perfect stage to capture what makes the levels of Sonic Unleashed work so well. Alternate routes that make the stage go faster, challenging obstacles to avoid, the core mechanics are put to good use in several ways, and the stage has this great scope to it. The levels of Unleashed all tell a story, like in Rooftop Run where you start in the midst of the town, but you work your way up to the rooftops which gets you closer to the giant clock tower at the center of the city that you platform to the very top of and then get to grind your way down back to the streets which takes you to the Gaia key that you were looking for, or Arid Sands beginning in the town of Shamar but far removed from it by the end. But let's slow down the action. To get to stages in the first place, Sonic and Chip must explore the towns of each area. Because of how they were designed in 06, hub worlds have a pretty bad rap in Sonic games. But these hub worlds are more numerous than, but also smaller than the hub worlds of Sonic Adventure. In hindsight, Sonic 06 didn't really need to have hub worlds so big. In all the hub worlds of Sonic Unleashed, it's clear that we're only in a smaller segment of a larger area, but the parts we actually explore are much simpler to not waste the player's time. If you want to, you can just go to the stages or you could talk to people, something that's much more interesting than in most of what Sonic 06 had to offer. You can buy stuff from each town's shop or explore for sun and moon medals. When going to the stages, there's a secondary hub of every area. The various stages, bosses, and extra levels being scattered across these areas like Advanced 3's hub worlds. Here you can mess around with your new abilities in the process of accessing stages like practicing werehog combos you unlocked, or using the hedgehog's unlockable abilities like the stomp that presses on switches, or the light speed dash which works exactly how it should this time around, and the air boost. This one should speak for itself as well, but also causes the most problems. In Unleashed, the homing attack button has been moved from pressing the jump button multiple times to pressing the square button after jumping. This change doesn't end the world on its own, but the boost button is also the square button and that is also the air boost button. The homing attack still comes with a reticle like in Secret Rings, however if you want to air dash to save yourself while platforming like you could in the previous games, or in this game before unlocking the air boost, you either need to hope the boost gauge is empty or just die. But this does get myself thinking. A few moments ago I said you could practice moves you unlock as the Werehog, but then referred to Daytime Sonic as... The Hedgehog. I mean, it's the same character but divided in two for this game. Logic would dictate that by calling Nighttime Sonic the Werehog as a short, then you could also call Daytime Sonic the Hedgehog as a short. But that just sounds weird and dumb. I could just call Daytime Sonic Sonic, but Werehog is also Sonic. Anyway, the pacing of Sonic Unleashed has a lot going against it. Every area has a day stage and a night stage. An Act 1 and Act 2, if you will. Daytime Sonic will fight bosses against Eggman mechs following Savannah Citadel, Rooftop Run, and Jungle Joyride. And the Werehog will battle against Dark Gaia creatures after playing Dragon Road, Cool Edge, and Arid Sands. The bosses in this game are a lot of fun to go against. Just like the Hedgehog stages, his bosses are all about avoiding obstacles at high speeds and it gets more intense each round. It's really satisfying to play, especially in the Egg Beetle fight where the boost will send Eggman flying and then you can boost into him again while he's already flailing and prolong that effect. It's base day up. Same as ever, all bark and no bite. For Nighttime Sonic, his bosses are based around you making the boss vulnerable like tossing water canisters at the Dark Gaia Phoenix or pushing blocks into the correct spaces against the Dark Guardian. But the subject of bosses got me off topic. But since I already am off topic, might as well mention the tornado stages before I forget about them. When going from Apatos to Spagonia, and when traveling to the final area, Sonic will ride on board the Tornado 3 and blast enemies as they fly towards you with the buttons that correspond to the controller of the console you're playing. These are actually my favorite iteration of the Tornado stage. Just felt like nothing was happening in Sonic 2 and Sonic Adventure 1. Here, my attention is kept from start to finish, as I lose my S rank on Xbox 360 because I have PlayStation buttons ingrained in my memory and not the Xbox ones. But let's go back to when I was saying I was getting off subject to get back on subject to what I was saying two points ago. The pacing of Sonic Unleashed is a problem if you're going to play through this game again. Every area has two acts, but you don't play them together like, say, classic and modern stages of Generations although you could play those out of order if you wanted to. But as I was saying, in Unleashed, you might have, say, Dragon Road Day and Cool Edge Night unlocked at the same time, but in between stage unlocks, your sorry ass has to go back to Pickle's lab, and he'll tell you to play these new stages that just opened, as you must then travel there and do them. It's not a big chunk of time taken up when it happens. In fact, when his lab is in Spagonia, you can just do this. But over time, this can be kind of annoying since you just want to get on with the game and have to sit through like six loading screens and running through the hub worlds just to unlock new stages. For the rooftop run boss fight, I went there and it wasn't open, but I had to run back to Pickle's office just for him to tell me to play that boss fight right now. 
even though I was literally just there. But that's something that becomes a bigger bother on repeat playthroughs of Sonic Unleashed. Now, what is the biggest hurdle for new players are the collectibles in every stage, the Sun and Moon Medals. Many stages will be blocked off via however many Sun and Moon Medals you need to collect to level up. On this playthrough, I was pretty proud of myself, actually. I never had to go back to any stages. Well, I couldn't get into Arid Sands Night, but Skyscraper Scamper Day was also opened at that time, so I didn't have to revisit any stages over it in this playthrough. Each run of Unleashed I have done, I've had to repeat less and less stages because of this, and therein lies the issue. On my first playthrough of Unleashed in 2008, I had to go back and collect medals to play, like, every stage, culminating in the final main level of the game, Jungle Joyride Day, which requires 120 Sun Medals to play. And then, I was a whole 42 medals away. This was 2009, second grade had just ended and I was hyped to play more Unleashed, and then I had to spend the entire summer collecting Sun Medals, not unlocking the stage until third grade was about to start. But then, my 360 red ringed. It was a nightmare. My 360 red ringed the first time when I beat the end of the world stage in Sonic 06 and saw this cutscene. Guess the scene is cursed. Not joking, by the way, that did happen. So yeah, on this playthrough of Unleashed, I was never halted from making progress because of the Sun and Moon medals, but this is my fifth playthrough or so. I'm already expecting that and can play around it, but it will be the bigger pace breaker for the first time player. Like I said at the beginning, when I was a kid, I played pretty much every game without a guide, so of course I spent a long time trying to beat Sonic 06 because of the meandering between stages. And I spent a long time on Unleashed because I had to spend forever trying to unlock stages. But of course, we've yet to address the Gaia Colossus in the room, the Werehogs gameplay. In retrospect, Sonic Team had a lot to prove following the disastrous response they got from Sonic 06. On that note, I don't really know why they thought it was a great idea to transform Sonic into Sonic the Werehog. Yeah, that ought to show everybody we haven't jumped the shark. From the offset, it just looks pretty stupid, but how does it actually work? Well, in the PlayStation 2 era, developers had finally figured out how to make combat games work in 3D. I've mentioned before that the basic beat-em-up from, say, the Super Nintendo didn't work as well when translating into 3D. Even on PlayStation 2, I'd say beat-em-up type games were fine, but if you wanted to do 3D combat action, you'd be best replicating 2001's Devil May Cry. But in particular, I'd say Sonic the Werehog was influenced the most by God of War, the PS2 classic that came out towards the start of the 7th generation, but was hugely successful. I own the God of War HD collection, but never really got around to playing much of it. Even with a minimal amount of God of War exposure, it's plainly evident how many ways the Werehog was inspired by those games. But, my point of comparison with the Werehog stages would just be my exposure to the Devil May Cry games. When looking at the technical minutia, the Werehog isn't as good as Devil May Cry 5. Shocking, I know. But when looking at what is here, you might expect Sonic Team's attempt at this kind of gameplay to be terrible, if only because of their track record, but I don't think that's being entirely fair either. Big was a failure, obviously, but I think the shooting mechanics in Sonic Adventure 1, 2, and even Shadow the Hedgehog hold up pretty decently. But the Werehog is far more than just decent, if you ask me. If it wasn't obvious via that preamble, the concept of the Werehog stages is that you make it from one side of the stage to another, but instead of high-speed antics, you must battle your way through dark Gaia monsters and Eggman mechs that tour the streets at night. The square button is how the Werehog scratches his enemies with his claws, and the triangle button will punch them directly. Giving these action game protagonists reach over their enemies is important. Just look at how Dante has the Stinger, or later on, Trickster, allowing you to teleport towards the enemies, or how Nero has the Streak and the Devil Bringer slash Breaker that brings enemies to you. The Werehog is given the ability to stretch his arms out really far, which is given almost no in-universe justification, but then lends itself towards the combat really well. The biggest difference between a game like Devil May Cry and Sonic Unleashed is that the Werehog's gameplay is based around hit combos. Variety is not the most important thing to combat. You can if you want to, but the main point is killing enemies with as many attacks as possible, as quickly as you can. Think of it like the Arkham games in that sense. Although, even scarier to think, when Sonic Unleashed came out, Arkham Asylum was still like a year away. I was there for both. There are kids who play video games that were born after Arkham Knight was released. Is this what it feels like to be old? Devil May Cry's style meter is more demanding of players since variety is now a required part of the combat in addition to the speed of your attacks, but ultimately I don't have a preference for how you do it in this example, because either or can lead to satisfying combat. You start out with some basic combos, a shield gauge which shows how much abuse you can take while blocking, and an unleashed bar which functions like the devil trigger or when Raiden turns into Jack the Ripper in Metal Gear Rising, a brief window where your attacks are more powerful. When beating enemies in stages, Sonic is awarded with experience points, and these you can spend on either the Hedgehog or Nighttime Sonic. Has that gotten cursed yet? 
That's what I'm going for. As I was saying, for Daytime Sonic, you can spend experience points to extend his total boost gauge or increase his top speed. When I play this game, I extend the boost gauge a little bit, but I don't think it's as important as upgrading the Werehog's combat, because this is how you unlock devastating new moves. When you unlock new moves, the game doesn't tell you how to do it or give a demonstration when unlocking, but this is what the skill list is for, dividing attacks in different categories. Punches, swipes, aerial moves, and special attacks, like breaking out of a dodge and turning into a powerful counterattack. There are a lot of things I really like about the Werehog combat, a small one being that the timing on the combos is very easy to remember. Take for example the Werehog's uppercut, allowing it to easily transition into aerial attacks. The uppercut is done by pressing the square button or triangle button twice and then the jump button. So if you are punching or swiping, you can transition into the air. The moves you unlock just tear through enemies like the charge, punch, and spin, or the cartwheel attack makes crowds of enemies nothing. Or how you can press the square button four times then triangle and just... There are numerous air combos. Of course, there's no DMC enemy step here, but the amount of air combos makes up for it. Like this one where you use the Werehog's big spiky cleats to kick the enemies away. There are attacks you can do while running, attacks you can do from the air after jumping out of a sprint. You can grab enemies and spin and smash them into each other. And the thing that ties the Werehog's gameplay all together would be the sound design. I'm sure this game uses a stock set of sound effects, but I don't care. Smashing up these dark Gaia creatures all at once can't not be satisfying when rewarded with these sound effects. The only issues I have with the Werehog's combat would make for a small list, but still things I don't like exist and I'll list them, starting with the sound design. The infamous Werehog battle music. Maybe it's a lot to ask for a unique battle theme in every area like it's Sly Cooper, but looking again at Devil May Cry, the games would have one battle theme for the first half of the game, like Shall Never Surrender or Taste the Blood, and then maybe, when you might be getting sick of that, you get a new theme for the back half of the game, like Lock and Load or Shoot the Works. And there, I just filled my Sly Cooper and Devil May Cry reference quota in one segment. If there was going to be one battle theme, I just feel like it shouldn't start with the same loud, bombastic bit at the beginning. It gets really annoying. Which is a shame because of the fact that this is a piece that's pretty long and has a lot of parts to it as it goes on. But most players will only remember the first couple of seconds. The other, more pressing issue I take with the Werehog combat are the combo finishers. When an enemy is reaching the bottom of their health bar, you can initiate a quick time event where you press buttons and then a time limit and then finish the enemy with several thousand points as your reward. Everyone knows at this point that numerous 7th gen games relied upon quick time events to make cool things happen. Devil May Cry 4 is standing at the top of the pile for not having any. Instead, making cool things happen through skill alone, it was pretty fucking based. You should play it sometime. Sometimes I want to do the combo finisher to get more points, but you can't start a QTE until the enemy has stood back up. You could just kill them with the normal attacks, but that's worth less points. Tying this many points to QTEs is lame, and then this aspect of it isn't that well designed anyway. But the Werehog isn't the only part of Unleashed that uses a lot of QTEs. The Tornado Defense game is based entirely around them for Pete's sake. But Sonic's normal stages also rely on QTEs during these dash pad bits. Word of advice, you get the most points not for hitting it the fastest, but during this little orange sweet spot in the time bar. Or at least, I'm assuming that's worth more points because you get the orange great text on the screen as opposed to the blue cool text. The whole challenge of QTEs, you know, hitting the button before time runs out, is lost anyway because you can just pause the game and practice the button sequence immediately. That's an oversight, but beneficial for me, especially on the Xbox playthrough. With all that said, I'm still not done with the Werehog because combat's only part of the equation. They also make use of the Werehog's stretchy arms to provide the players with some basic platforming to break up the combat. I think the Werehog's platforming does provide the stages with a great sense of scale. Take Rooftop Run and Skyscraper Scamper, for example. In the former case, the stage takes place on the ground for the most part, but when you get to the clock tower that regular Sonic climbed the outside of, the Werehog will be climbing up the tower with the gears in the inside, as you have to manipulate the clock to platform further. Now, the streets you started out on are far away in distance. In the latter case, the whole level is suspended over the city as the traffic rushes by. It gives that natural feeling of vertigo when climbing the stage. The biggest talking point relating to the Werehog will be the portion of the game taken up by his stages. In truth, I think all the boost Sonic games show off the fact that the daytime mechanics have a hard time carrying an entire game on their own. To be fair, you could say that Adventure 1 and 2 have this problem as well. I'd argue less for the other three games, because those games basically had the same gameplay for the entire duration of the game with character-specific gimmicks attached to each segment. 
Anyway, when Adventure 1 and 2 were made, I suppose the games fell victim to how many 3D platformers worked to include multiple playable characters. It made the game feel bigger. By the time you get to Sonic Unleashed and looking back on it now, it's impossible to not notice that the boosting Sonic gameplay has never existed on its own without some other mechanics spicing it up. I'd say even Sonic Colors has this problem, before comments speak to the contrary. Now, that's not really the end of the world, it's just something to notice. The question then becomes, what gimmicks do supplement the main gameplay? In the case of the Werehog, this God of War clone routine is so far removed from what anyone really wants out of Sonic, so therefore people feel like this gameplay padded out the game because they wanted to play these levels. I think it's an important thing to point out up front because it colors the rest of the commentary related to the Werehog. As we have established, the Werehog's not perfect, but I think this is a really fun God of War clone in a Sonic game. The combat has depth, the stages have platforming, the spectacle is really high. I have fun playing as the Werehog. But I think the attitude of not wanting to play as this version of Sonic leads to people to beg for the stages to end. But looking at my playthrough, I don't really feel like there are any Werehog stages that go on longer than a typical level in this genre. Look at Dante's first mission in Devil May Cry 5. That part lasts over 10 minutes, maybe even 15 on every run. The only time I can call the Werehog stages into question would just be Arid Sands Night, where there's a segment at the end with a beginner's trap and annoying enemies that will drag your stay on much longer than it should be. On that note, the day stages are also pretty meaty, like I said. In Generations, a stage lasts like two minutes, but on Unleashed, rooftop run day is like six minutes, and I don't mind. I just love how much content there is in Sonic Unleashed. Werehog's no different. Now, if you think the Werehog takes up too much space in this game because you don't like it fundamentally, I think that's fine. I just came back to it on this run and was surprised it was as fun as it was. Which seems to be a take I'm seeing a lot more of these days. Sonic Unleashed has two gameplay styles, however what is obvious is that they're both Sonic, technically. This game cut back the playable roster by quite a lot. The story also keeps the cast of characters pretty small. This time around, we have Sonic, Tails, small appearances from Amy, Eggman as the villain, Chip, and Professor Pickle, I suppose. Tails is a part of Sonic's mission, but he barely has a role in the plot. I mean, he basically disappears from the game once the world map opens up. This game also begins many elements of what you might call the modern Tails doesn't really participate in anything going on, he just helps from the sidelines and begs for help on the sidelines while he's at it. But, for a reason I can explain in a moment, I don't mind it too much this time around. The story shows how Sonic feels about being a monster at night by mentioning he hopes nobody sees him like this four cutscenes in, and then by bringing back the Amy confuses someone for Sonic trope, only this time, it is Sonic. That's effective. However, nothing really gets done with that outside of those two cutscenes. Sonic Unleashed is a really good example of how to write Dr. Eggman as well. He's the reason everything happens in the first place. He's evil and he loves being evil. This game marked the debut of Eggman's assistant, Orbot, who wouldn't be given that name till the next game, but hey, he makes his only funny appearance this time around. I think it's the voice. And now the planet's coming back together! <laughs> that doctor is the result of the power of the Chaos Emeralds, which you discarded along with Sonic. Ergo, another repercussion of your hasty actions. Quiet, you junkie! That was all part of my plan! Part of the big picture! Where's the fun in having my plan succeed without any challenge? Orbot works really well on Unleashed because Eggman is constantly having his flaws like arrogance and buffoonery mocked by this robot, but he also needs Orbot to perform functions he'd rather not do, like manage projects and machines that Eggman is not. Like how Eggman arrives in Missouri to find the temple but gets his ass kicked by Sonic and just has Orbot control the machines that you face going forward. The main driving force of Unleashed's story is the friendship between Sonic and Chip. This is why Tails being sidelined is fine for this one. Pretty much all of the games going forward don't have many events in their plot, it's more about the characters interacting and in Unleashed's case, Sonic and Chip have to be executed well for the story to work. I can start by saying that the English voice acting isn't doing Chip any favors out of the gate. He comes off like a scrappy do type character. I think it gets better as the game goes along, although maybe that's because there are less cutscenes towards the middle of the game, but still, by the last act, I'm not cringing like I was in cutscene 1, that's all. The guy who voices him also has an instantly recognizable voice. Hey, those dudes look just like us! Don't flatter yourselves! Although on that note, I feel like most 4Kids voice actors tend to. Not a big deal, I just wanted to share an observation I had. On the subject of voice acting, I think this is where things really improved. Early 4 Kids era Sonic games had vocal performances that were really over enunciated and very stilted. Now, you compare Tails from 06, who was a total spaz, and now he's calm and collected. Dr. Eggman having a balance between villain and cartoon character, the balance of humor and evil we all know and love, rather than the more generic showing in 06. 
But the biggest win here is Jason Griffith as Sonic. If you were to ask me, of the English voices, which Sonic actor was the best, I'd say Jason Griffith in a heartbeat. And that's because of this game in Black Knight, where he's everything I love about Sonic. Cool, collected, friendly, adventurous, and all that good stuff. Now, just with a really normal sounding voice, I love it. Sonic helping Chip being great characterization, he just acts and does what's right, no questions asked. Sonic tries to help Chip, not knowing that he has anything to do with the main plot, but because he thought it was right. Chip turns out to be the opposite of Dark Gaia, Light Gaia, and tries to leave Sonic at the end to stop Dark Gaia alone, but... I mean, there's no reason for you to come along, so I should just... Do I need a reason to want to help out a friend? That's Sonic right there. That's why I love this character in stories like Sonic Unleashed. The post-Jungle Joyride Day cutscenes are why I love the story in a nutshell. Revealing that Sonic's will alone is the only reason he doesn't succumb to Dark Gaia's influence at night like so many others the duo have seen in the story thus far. It's actually pretty subversive, since you'd think the Monster Within trope is what they'd be going for here, but Sonic doesn't have that problem, he just turns into a version of himself with different abilities. That first cutscene with Chip might make you wince, but as it goes along, you really start to enjoy the dynamic. This adventure between Sonic and Chip, exploring the world, gives Sonic Unleashed a unique identity in this series. It's a fun setup, what can I say? The story feels like it has impact because of all the people Sonic and Chip interact with. Humans in Sonic games as background characters has been a debate for a while, but I think most people agree that Sonic Unleashed is that trope at its best. The cartoony designs just help sell that this is supposed to be in the same world as Sonic and his cast of characters. I just said that the humans add impact to the story, which you might find odd given the fact that the whole planet has split apart and nobody cares unless they're possessed by Dark Gaia at night, which you then must save them from. However, I think this is interesting. If you're going to write an apocalyptic scenario, the Majora's Mask approach is probably the best practice. That game took place over the course of three days, and as it gets closer to the end, the people become more and more unnerved by that fact. However, when looking at how Sonic Unleashed handles it, I think it's charming. The people of this world aren't going to stop being themselves because the world is split apart. They need to be under the influence to fall victim to fear and anger. It's not realistic, but like I said, I think it's charming. Kind of like how each area has its own distinct culture. Cartoony versions of what exists in real life. These people don't go to war, they don't have to worry about extremism or any of that sort of thing. They just have their own customs that make them all different in superficial ways, like the food they eat, which is something that can be shared between cultures to spice up life. Your actions as the hero of the story directly contribute to the culture of the game, like this girl from Shamar who's in Apatos. When you put the planet back together, she can try to find her way home, only to find herself all over the globe, ending up actually enjoying the atmosphere of Adabat. Or the tribe leader from Missouri deciding to travel to Chunnan after the village is saved. The reporter from Empire City travels all over the world to get the story on what happened. A businessman from Empire City is trying to help a girl who lives with her grandmother in Spagonia, or the boy in Apatos whose father is a fisherman who you can find in Adabat. It's stories like these that make Sonic Unleashed interesting. It gives the game a scale, it gives context to your actions, and I find that to be absolutely valuable in the Sonic Unleashed experience. Something I don't think you could as easily do with Anthro characters because it's relatable to the audience when it's humans. Human roles, I think, are best fit as human roles is what I think makes this the best use of humans in the series, because I don't think you could say that about SA1, 2, Shadow, or 06. Now, of course, what would a good Sonic game be without a great soundtrack? Well, it would be a good Sonic game without a great soundtrack, but I don't think there has been one... yet, so yeah. With Sonic Unleashed ranking as my second favorite Sonic soundtrack behind 06. You can take what I thought about the 06 music, like it feeling more pleasing on the ears and more serious, for lack of a better phrase, than previous games, and you can apply that to Unleashed. Here we have a specific gimmick with how the soundtrack is done. Since this game takes place in all these different countries, we have music that feels in place when it comes to instrument choice and such for those areas and cultures, but you have to split that philosophy in two. One for light speed action day stages and slow platforming night stages, and the result is just an unforgettable soundtrack that has exactly what you come to expect in the day stages. more inspired variety in the night stages.
I also love this main theme from the Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra called The World Adventure. This track is the bombastic music you're met with every time you turn the game on and look at the world map. That main tune being the foundation the game works with when making the impactful cutscene music. The main vocal theme, Endless Possibilities, being done by Bowling for Soup, and this track has always been special when thinking back on this game. I mean, it's nothing like the previous themes, since Crush 40 had nothing to do with the soundtrack for this game. When I was a kid, I'd listen to the main themes of Sonic games all the time, and uh, who am I kidding, we're still doing that now. As I was saying though, this track has a special place in my memory. When I first heard it, it just sounded so emotional. I don't know, seeing footage of the new game trying all these new things for the series alongside this really uplifting song about, as the name suggests, Endless Possibilities really left an impression on me. When thinking about this game now, Endless Possibilities just makes me think of the position the team was in making the game. It was what I talked about at the beginning. Sonic Team just released one of the biggest disasters in gaming history and still weren't going to give up trying to make the new game as good as they possibly could anyway? That's what this song gets me to think of. Hell, even my sister said it wasn't terrible, unlike the rest of the drivel that came out of these Sonic games I'd always play. Sonic Team developed a brand new engine to make Sonic Unleashed with, the Hedgehog engine. With this, they were able to produce the caliber of graphics they were in this game. I'm afraid while writing the script that the video will look absolutely terrible on YouTube because of the compression that YouTube applies to 1080p videos is insanely terrible. But when you play Unleashed, the lighting, the textures, the models, and the shading, it looks absolutely fantastic. However, this comes at a trade-off. This game must have come from the future because it was not meant to run on the Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3. EXO's video goes into a lot more detail on this, but you start with the fact that to achieve these great looking graphics, the game runs at a substandard resolution and caps the 360 version at 30 frames per second. Not saying it doesn't go below that, because it certainly does, Jungle Joyride Day looking at you. The PS3 version has an uncapped frame rate and will spend most of your playtime bouncing between 30 and 60 FPS. It basically is a matter of preference as to which you prefer, capped 360 gameplay or uncapped PS3. And I completely just used footage to lie. I showed PS3 footage while saying 360 and vice versa because to me there really isn't that much of a difference. I know, I've played both. But if you want the potential for 60 FPS, by all means PS3 version, although it takes a little longer to load, so be afraid of that. The 360 version can also be played on the Xbox Series X and not suffer from the issues it did back in 2008, so there's also that. But it's still 30 FPS. I'm of two minds here because I think Sonic Unleashed looks great, but can I please get a PC version on Steam? I can live with this game's console performance, but I just think that this game would feel so much better if it was a perfect 60 FPS. This is basically my thing with most 7th gen games. I tend to think 6th gen games are better played in original hardware because the devs of the remasters might have fucked something up, but I think these 30 FPS 7th gen games look absolutely terrible. So yes, Nathan Drake Collection, DMC Definitive Edition, Last of Us Remastered, I'm here for it. When using your PC, you could mod the Unleashed stages into Generations, and that's a lot of fun, but it's not the Unleashed experience, you know? No Werehog, no Hub Worlds, no Story, all the great things that make the game truly what it is outside of the boosting stages. And if you don't have all that other stuff, you just don't have Sonic Unleashed in my opinion. To play the full Unleashed on PC, you could emulate it with a computer like mine, and now here you run into two problems. With the 360 emulator Xenia, you can turn off V-Sync in the settings and get a perfect 60 FPS that way. But Xenia barely works with Unleashed and crashes frequently. On the other hand, you have the PS3 emulator RPCS3, which actually can play Unleashed from start to finish. But no perfect 60 FPS yet. To increase performance, you can patch the game to turn off things like shadows and the character models that would lighten the load. Wasn't really doing much for me as you can see on the screen, but the point is emulation is far from being the perfect Unleashed experience, so come on Sega, please just give us the game on Steam, and Sonic Colors as well, and Sonic Heroes, and Shadow, and like all the games you haven't done yet. Seriously though, why did a fan have to properly give us Sonic 1 and 2 Remastered on PC and a version of Sonic CD with integer scaling? It's Sonic 1 and 2 Remastered, I really don't know why Sega would give up that free money. But hey, more credit to the fan base. Anyway, I can't talk much about this console presentation issue because I don't really care that much. Exo talked about it to a degree I never could, and I agree with his points. But I can play Unleashed just fine on any console, but I just really want that damn PC port. Speaking of something Exo covered in depth, there's a plethora of post-game content in Unleashed. Starting with the usual ranking system. Well, I say the usual ranking system, but I've never fully S-ranked Sonic Unleashed, and if you've seen Exo's video, you'd probably get an idea why. This game pulls no punches when it comes to S ranks. In the day stages, getting an A should not be too hard, just reach the end of the stage without dying. But the S requires total mastery of everything the stage has to offer. Like I alluded to earlier, each day stage has multiple shortcuts you must be aware of in order to get an S. Like this part of Arid Sands. 
You have to jump off of this loop at the right time to completely skip this platforming segment. You have to do the same at this point here to skip to another platforming segment which takes several seconds off of your run. You also can't get hit because collecting rings gives you no points in this game. Instead, you get a big point bonus for having more rings by the time the stage is over. I've S-ranked every main day stage in this game, and that's because I enjoy the gameplay enough to try, but it is hard. But honestly, in a way that I found kind of endearing. I mean, dying over and over from stuff you can't see coming slash needing to know things you can't even see is total bullshit. And going back to Sonic Adventure 2, we had a great A-rank campaign that didn't need tricks like that. But that's just part of the fun for me in Unleashed. I love how difficult it is because a run that's worthy of an S is what I said when talking about the day stages earlier. It's a blast. It's a mastery of mechanics that's what should grant players an S. A demanding ranking system is part of what makes me love these levels. For the Werehog, coming back to stages after the game was over kind of showed me that this game probably could have used a Werehog must die mode because a lot of the stages are completely bent over backwards by a late game Werehog. Not dying, more QTE points, and hit combo length is basically all it requires to get an S as the Werehog. But if you do want that higher challenge I just alluded to, then Sonic Unleashed's various DLC campaigns should give you something to look forward to. Literally every stage gets three or four DLC levels as both the Hedgehog and Nighttime Sonic. For the Werehog, you get that more difficult platforming and stronger enemies in the levels, exactly what I was saying the main stages lacked in terms of satisfying post-game material. For the day stages, these DLC levels pull less punches than the main ones already did. I mean, I'm talking about spikes everywhere, real-time reaction tests, it's horseshit, especially the five lap one from Chun Nan, but like I said, this aspect of it is fun to me. I don't feel obliged to get all the S ranks, so therefore I can laugh at how absurd the challenge is with this. They packed these DLC stages to the brim with stuff you could barely see coming and it just makes me laugh. Like I have fun imagining how much fun they had finding ways to test players in the spot like this. Now I did rage at the DMC2 S ranks, and that's because it was bullshit in a video talking about S-ranking the game. I'm just giving my thoughts on Sonic Unleashed here. S-ranks that are nightmarish is a valid point, it's just not something I'm bothered by. I'm just amused by how much I suck at these impossible stages. Especially when my abysmal run of the 5 lap Chun Nan stage grants me with a fucking E-rank. And the E-rank music. If you get an E, the game just starts making fun of you with out of sync and off key music. Yes, you do suck. You do have to start over. That's a lot of fun. Okay, so we talked about the gameplay, the world, the story, the bonus content, all that good stuff. So now comes the part we talk about the end game of Sonic Unleashed. You know, I wrote the word end game with a capital E. Too used to that being a title, not a regular word. Anyway, I've looked at all these Sonic end games in their own dedicated segment removed from everything else, and I think that has been for the benefit of these videos. No game makes that more obvious than Sonic Unleashed because they went all out with this finale. While Sonic and company have worked to bring the continents back together, Eggman has harnessed Dark Gaia's power and has built his base on top of the final continent. But this isn't an ordinary Eggman base, it's THE Eggman base. It's motherfucking Eggman land. The lair of the beast. The den of evil. The epicenter of ecological destruction. If you get the reference, I'll heart your comment. Anyway, this is the ultimate amusement park of madness built by the Doctor, in his own image, specifically designed to kill Sonic. And it's great that the devs did go all out and make this the final area. It could just be an Eggman base, and I suppose it would be the same thing, but literally Eggman's end goal for the entire series was to build a city that he rules over with statues erected in his image. Look at Sonic CD. Stardust Speedway's Bad Future has a giant Robotnik statue. He calls his end goal Robotnik Land in Sonic Adventure 1. He splits the world apart in Sonic Advance 3 so he could build Eggman Land. This Eggman Land thing has just been his goal the whole time, and now we get a final stage dedicated to that. He has finally won. Almost. We have to get through this madhouse in order to stop him yet again. And it's set up in context like that which makes it for a great final stage. Everyone who has finished this game knows how hard this level is. Take everything about the day stages and ramp it up to 11. QTEs you must react to in 3 seconds, obstacles you never saw before like these ones that come out of the wall in 2D sections, or my favorite, this brief bit where you're going through the square and triangle button panels and the game has used numerous times before, but for a brief second, you have to quickly press circle on one of them. 
a total gotcha surprise. This stage throws everything including the kitchen sink at you and it's absolutely awesome. Multiple pathways to explore, fast paced set pieces like a roller coaster that flies off the tracks and onto another track where Sonic has to try not to get smashed, pits, lasers, spikes, bombs, it's everything including constant reminders that this is Eggman's land. And climactic music for the day portions. Yeah, I did say day portions. Numerous times in the stage, you'll switch to Werehog Sonic to progress forward and have to deal with elite Eggman mechs and tough platforming, ending with three giant Gaia monsters back to back. This is where the whole making it as insanely hard as possible thing can get annoying, because the Werehog has to do these platforming segments with a pretty terrible camera angle, a wonky double jump, and not a single drop shadow in sight. Making the daytime portions annoying on purpose kind of amuses me, but the nighttime portions killing me when I don't feel like it's my fault from things like not having a drop shadow when platforming, that pisses me off. Even when the game provides an extra life after the checkpoint that keeps respawning, in essence giving you unlimited tries. But in that case, why does the game even have lives and game overs anyway? Now you might be thinking, how does a stage have time for that much carnage? Well, it makes time. This level takes like 20 minutes if you know what you're doing, and a lot more if you don't. It's insane, but that's why I enjoy it so much as the last level. It has some annoying parts, but on the whole is a great, unforgettable final stage. Following that, we get a multi-part final battle. Starting off as the Werehog against Eggman inside the Egg Dragoon, a machine that had its prototype destroyed by Supersonic in the opening cutscene. Here, we aren't Supersonic, it's the Werehog who wrecks the shit out of it anyway. This is less of a challenging boss and more of a total smackdown, and it's really fun to play this boss and tear its health bar to pieces and reduce parts of this intricate battle mech to scrap with your bare hands. Cool detail, the fact that Eggman Land is the final plan here isn't just something I get as a fan, it's also something you can kind of hear in Eggman's dialogue during this boss fight. Like, he wants to kill Sonic really badly, he's totally done with this rivalry. I choose to claim this was intentional because Mike Pollock's delivery of the lines sounds really desperate and unhinged as Eggman more than ever before, especially when it's clear he's probably going to lose again, at one point asking Sonic to just die already, with this music backing the moment perfectly, especially in the parts where you go through the ground into the planet's core. But when Eggman is lost again, Dark Gaia rises and then betrays him and is the true final boss fight. First, taking back his power from Sonic, making it so that Sonic can't be the Werehog anymore. Chip, using his powers as Light Gaia, brings back all the temples to his position and uses this as armor against Dark Gaia, the Gaia Colossus. Dr. Eggman is yet again not the final boss fight, something that has become a well-established trope by this point in the series. But, if I may, I don't think it's so simple as Monster of the Week as the trope has been reduced to. Like, look at the game where this happens. In SA1, it was a plot twist in and of itself that Chaos was the true final boss fight. In Adventure 2, Eggman was the main villain, but Shadow clearly had his own plan that came about in the last story, but he's not the final boss. The previous Ultimate Lifeform iteration is, following the orders left behind by the deceased Gerald Robotnik. The context between SA1 and SA2 is totally different. In Heroes, Eggman made Metal Sonic capable of the feats he pulls off, and just turns against him. In Shadow and in 06, it's clear from the beginning that Eggman isn't the main villain of the overall story, but is a large player. Hell, even in Advance 3, Eggman directly fights alongside Sonic because he knows how powerful these Gizoids are when they have all the Emeralds. Here in Unleashed, I think that's the closest the games have come towards feeling the same with the climax, but once again, the context is different. Dark Gaia wasn't even a player in the story until Eggman brought the final boss straight to him. And now we have to finish the job as you control the Gaia Colossus and move towards Dark Gaia, then playing a Sonic one last time to reach Dark Gaia's eyes and hit them with a homing attack. I don't know what they were going for with this Colossus bit, but nothing is happening as you boost towards him and he tosses rocks at you. Really slowly. Not challenging, not intense, not really fun, don't like this part. Sonic's platforming being the exact opposite of that, but it's cut up by these monotonous chip parts in between. Once that's done, Dark Gaia gets more powerful and all hope seems lost until Sonic uses the Chaos Emeralds to transform into Super Sonic, the true final battle. Starting at this game, it became a tradition for the final boss to take the main vocal theme and do an orchestral version of it, first happening in Sonic 06. Even if these instruments don't sound anything like a real orchestra, I like this track a lot and I think it really adds to that feeling that you've reached, as Sonic says, the big finale of this massive journey.
I love the moment of the final boss, but mechanically, it's easily the worst one yet in the 3D series. This supersonic bit not even being a fight against the monster, it's taking down the shield while Chip does the real fighting. Ending with the biggest quick time event in the game as Sonic blasts right through Dark Gaia, putting him out of commission. Does everyone like how climactic it is when I play the results screen after essentially beating the game and beginning to wind the review down? I know I do, which is why I had to play this 10 minute final fight for a second time because you don't get ranked until your second run of the boss, because that makes sense. Anyway, ending time. Dark and Light Guy have been doing this battle every couple of centuries, and now that it's over again, the two must go back to sleep inside the core, when in his final moments, Chip saves Sonic from the inside of the core. Meanwhile, the people of the places we've been to celebrate the day being saved. These scenes are the highlight of Unleashed cutscene music for me. And we also get our first Eggman epilogue scene in the series, this one probably being the most entertaining. You can simply begin your plans anew. Even if all of your efforts this last time were utterly wasted, even if it was a complete and utter humiliating loss, even the most pathetic loser in all the world will shut up. The ending of the story being one of my favorites in the series. Ending exactly where it began, only Sonic is left with Chip's ring, which he wears to remember his friend by, someone he spent the whole game with and will never see again. Not saying much throughout this whole scene, it's just a new day, and so begins a new adventure, whatever that may be. Ending. Sonic Unleashed. <laughs> During the credits, we get to hear Endless Possibilities, The World Adventure, and the closing vocal, Dear My Friend, performed by Brent Cash. This one actually being kind of sad when played at the end of this game. I feel like all these four kids era games are about Sonic and some new character having a friendship that inevitably ends and that gets a sad song about it in the credits. But I like this one. I just hope you like the filtered vocals. That's not going anywhere anytime soon. Now, what do I think of Sonic Unleashed? Well, I think it's great. Maybe I sounded critical at certain points of this game, but on the whole, I think this script really shows how I feel about Sonic Unleashed. With each and every run of Unleashed I do, the game just gets better every time. It's a full campaign with unforgettable moments, great cutscenes, and story that show improvements over previous games in direction and shots and animation. It just really feels like a big budget Sonic game. It stands out from the crowd with these really challenging stages and a very good replication of the God of War gameplay with the Werehog. Unleashed isn't perfect. Bad console performance, new mechanics needing ironing out, some of the padding is annoying, but Unleashed is a really unique experience in the series' catalog, and that makes it fun to revisit every time I play it again. It's one of my favorites in the series, and I know a lot of people are expressing how they feel the same way, and I think its unique qualities are why that is. It leaves an impact on people who play it, and again, that's what I love about it. Which is why I think it should get modern day ports. I think this game should not be left behind. I think more people should be able to play it. And that's my take on Unleashed. Now, I know many people who didn't finish the video have commented about my thoughts on the port this game got to the Wii, and that'll be for next time. But in the meantime, I've got nothing else to add here, so thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time.